how do you become a surgeon? How do you join a high-impact career full of high stakes and split-second decisions, often with life and death consequences? How do you contribute to a field with a long and storied history? How do you join a profession where most of the practitioners don't even look like you nor share your background? How do you know if you can really, really even do it? Do something beyond your reality that supersedes even your wildest dreams? Where do you even start? All of these thoughts ran through my 24-year-old mind as I considered what residency to pursue after medical school. For perspective, medical students in the United States are exposed to the basic disciplines of medicine through a series of hands-on courses called clinical clerkships. Here, students join teams of physicians to care for real patients in hospitals and clinics. The ultimate goals of these experiences are not only to learn and approach to the disease processes of each individual specialty, but also to provide students with tangible exposure so they can decide what kind of doctor they want to be. After they complete all of their clinical clerkships, students apply to specialty-specific residency programs. And in residency, newly minted physicians spend three to seven years gaining the skills and knowledge requisite for the independent practice of their craft. For me, as a medical student, I enjoyed my clinical clerkships, all of them to a certain extent, but none of them, none of them spoke to me like my rotation through surgery. To me, the surgeons, those surgeons, they were really, really cool. They were show up to a chaotic situation, calm everybody down, and inevitably make the right decision cool. They were show up, do a really neat, really slick operation, identify anatomy that at the time I never even heard of, and then take the whole team to lunch cool. Those surgeons, those surgeons had this swagger. They had this presence, and I thought it was awesome. And I also knew in my mind that when it came to the practice of medicine, the surgeons were cooler than I thought I was or what I would ever be. Because you see, at that time, the idea of a surgical career was aspirational. Sure, I knew how to apply for residency. I knew how to have the right metrics. I knew how to interview well. I could create a facade that belied my underlying insecurities. But in full transparency, I was terrifyingly unsure. I didn't know if I was making the right decision, nor if surgery would be a good long-term fit. I did not know if I had the wherewithal to think the way the surgeons thought, let alone do the things I saw the surgeons do. At that time, I felt almost like an imposter, an imposter in scrubs, just trying my hardest not to be seen. Now, flash forward to now, after five years of clinical training in surgery, two years of training in clinical surgical research, two years of training in liver and transplants and kidney transplantation, and seven years of practice, my perspective has shifted. As I've traversed that education continuum, I now fully understand that almost all of these fears were artificial under my own design. And once I finally learned how to think beyond me and my self-imposed limitations, I could then fully embrace opportunities and possibilities. And now, as program director for the general surgery residency at Baylor College of Medicine, I surreally find myself at the opposite, ex at the opposite end of this continuum advising medical students and residents as they start their own journeys. And through my experiences as both a teacher and a student, I've gained a set of deliberate skills that, when employed effectively, can quiet voices of doubt that can impede your progress. Now, full disclosure, everything I'm about to talk to you about and everything I'm going to teach you is highly personal and completely anecdotal. Yet, I believe these are powerful tools that can shift your focus 
and allow you to do things you didn't think you can do. So for just a few moments, I urge you to join me as I explore lessons from the operating room in changing your mind's mind. Okay, y'all all set? Let's do it. Lesson number one, you are very, very special. Incredibly special, in fact. But you're not unique. To every undertaking in life, you bring a set of highly personal experiences. These experiences, these attributes, provide the framework through which you see the world and the world sees you. Every one of these experiences are impactful beyond measure. Each is invaluable. Each is precious. However, in the totality of human experience on this planet, both recent and remote, your experiences are not exclusive to you. Instead, these experiences are part of the vastness and the beauty of the collective human experience. Your experiences are part of a bigger community, and there is power in recognizing that connection. Uh, let me explain. I believe that as human beings, we are all drawn towards community. Community provides us with context, it provides us with purpose. And this need for community is most probably hardwired into our brains. In his book, Social, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Connect, Dr. Matthew Lieberman provides significant evidence to suggest that not only are social interactions intrinsic to our very existence, but that our brains have evolved to seek connection to others as a primary goal in itself. Further, these social connections improve both well-being and performance. And I've seen this to be true in my experiences as an educator. Rule number one in medical school is that studying in groups is far more effective than studying as an individual. And when you value people, when you focus on people, the work carries more meaning. Your attitude improves. You see things that you do more positively and the better you function. So what does this look like in practice? For some, it may mean finding a silent connection to someone in a similar situation and thinking in your head, if they can do it, so can I. For others, it may mean finding commonality in the experiences and contributions of previous generations and looking for belonging there. And for others, it may even mean looking to the future and knowing what you do today can positively impact the experiences of others yet to come. However you do it, finding community and belonging can quiet voices in your mind that tell you to isolate in the context of difficult situations. Now, I'm not telling you that this search for community will negate all external barriers, and it does not mean that everything is fair. But at the very least, finding belonging can stop those voices in your head that limit you from accomplishing new things. Lesson number two, a little bit of irrational in just the right dose is probably a good thing. Now, as a general surgery resident, I was indoctrinated with the belief that surgery on any patient with end-stage liver disease, also known as a patient with cirrhosis, also known as cirrhotics, was ripe with danger. In fact, we learned that the physiologic stress from any surgery, no matter how big nor small, could very well result in these patients' deaths. And sure enough, this dogma was proven true in that any time I saw a cirrhotic receive an emergency operation, the outcomes were not good. Now, as a transplant surgeon, I go out and search for cirrhotics. The sicker, the better. And I have every belief in my mind that I can put this very sick patient population through one of the biggest operations that any human being can tolerate. And I think they'll survive it. And also what I think we can do is we can go to a deceased donor. We can take their liver out. We can put that liver on ice put that liver on a plane, fly that liver back to Houston, and in the recipient operating room, we can take a bad liver out of a very sick patient, sew a new liver in, that liver that was on ice, and I have every expectation that after this entire tour de force, not only will that patient survive, 
but in a few months, they'll be normal. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Outside of my job, this seems very far-fetched. And when I started my fellowship, it felt impossible. You see, in my approach to this new undertaking, I carried with me my experiences from general surgery. And I found that knowledge, that fixed false belief, what a cirrhotic could and could not tolerate, was paralyzing and slowed my progression in learning this new intervention and performing it successfully. Now, in hindsight, my rationale was flawed. I simply had not had adequate exposure to this very niche patient population that understood what could happen. And I used this false information to influence how I behaved in a new situation. But in fact, my approach was probably not unreasonable and not uncommon. All of us make decisions based on previous experiences to create the best possible outcomes and to avoid danger. The problem becomes when this is applied too readily to a new situation, it can impede forward progress. Instead, when I have a new problem now, I consider all options, no matter how irrational they may seem, no matter how off the wall, because you never know. Every now and again, the crazy option gets the job done. Lesson number three, you can't get there on your own and help may look different than what you expect. It is amazing to me how the term pull yourself up by your bootstraps occupies a place in the American dialect that is completely opposite of its initial intended meaning. When it first appeared in English writing in the mid 19th century, this phrase was intended as sarcasm as it is quite literally impossible to pull yourself in one direction or the other by pulling on your shoes. Nonetheless, for whatever reason, in popular culture right now, this idea of self-determination and independent achievement and individual accomplishments is seen as the epitome of individual achievement. For some people, it's true. And when I say for some, I mean one or two. For the vast majority of us, of us and I mean almost everybody, none of us get there on our own. Instead, we get there with the help of someone else. But to get this help, you have to actively look for help, and you have to be open to receiving help. And this can be incredibly difficult because it requires a level of vulnerability beyond what we're most comfortable with. But if you remind yourself that everybody needs this help, that everybody needs mentorship and sponsorship, you can quiet those fears. I'm going to take you back to my first year of general surgery residency. And I was convinced that my calling in life was to be a pediatric surgeon. I did my pediatric surgery rotations early in the academic year, and I had a great experience in transplant that was nowhere near on my agenda. In fact, I was dreading my transplant rotation because I had heard on the street from all the residents that that transplant service required long days and late nights. And let me tell you, long days and late nights, that is not my thing. So May comes around and I find myself on the rotation. And much to my chagrin and pleasant surprise, not only do I enjoy the work, but I found on that service two transplant surgeons who were very interested in what I wanted to do and how transplant could align with my goals. And from those relationships, from that initial connection, I have mentors and sponsors that have contributed to my life in ways beyond measure. It's amazing to me the impact that was made, but what it required was a mind that was receptive to help and also a mind that could see that help could come from many different sources. Okay, to recap what we learned today, lesson number one, you are special, but you are not unique. Lesson number two, a little bit of crazy goes a long way. And lesson number three, you can't do it alone and help can look in many different ways. These three tenets have positively impacted my surgical career, positively impact my residence, and I believe for you can positively impact whatever you want to accomplish. It's amazing the ways in which your attitude can influence your success or failure. I believe with small, deliberate changes to your thoughts, 
with small alterations to what you believe, you can create huge, huge dividends. I believe changing your mind's mind is nowhere near as difficult as you may think. Thank you all for your time today. Oh, and by the way, if any of you guys want to learn surgery, just give me a call. Have a good evening.